Well, welcome everyone to our 2021 final edition episode of Driven. And I couldn't have thought of a better guest to have than my dear friend, Mr. Kevin Guest. I first met Kevin in 2009 and immediately upon meeting him, you become fascinated by this dude. He is just a great bloke, an Aussie term for a really awesome person. And I would best describe him as a rock and roll CEO. We'll explore that in a minute. Kevin is the chairman and CEO of the company I'm involved in, USANA Health Sciences. In addition, this year, Kevin was elected as chairman of the board of the Direct Selling Association and is also a member of the CEO Council of the World Federation of Direct Selling Companies. And in his lifetime, has achieved numerous accolades for his contribution to business and community. Please go to kevinguest.com after this interview and find out even more about this fascinating bloke. Before USANA, Kevin served as a managing partner at FMG, a video and events production company. But all throughout his career, music has been instrumental, pardon the pun, uh, in his life. And highlights include sharing the stage with such greats as Kenny Loggins, Belinda Carlisle, Tommy Shaw, Eddie Money, and performing at the Grand Old Opry twice. Uh, and with country music superstar Colin Ray, he continues to tour and perform, and let's not forget about the amazing band, The Free Radicals, that he performs with regularly. Welcome to the program, Kevin. Great to see you, mate. Hey, great to see you too. Uh, I'll, I'll trust you that the term bloke is a good term. It's a very good, it's a very good term. And wonderful okay. to see you all the way in uh, Salt Lake City. You guys are getting ready for winter, and we're, of course, heading into summer. Yeah, it's, uh, we've got snow in the mountains, ski resorts are opening in a couple days, and uh, you know we're hoping for a lot of snow this summer, or this winter. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to coming over and having a ski. Ski on the beautiful mountains there. Hey, Kevin, as I was prepping for today, I was thinking that we needed a few more hours to cover everything that there is to talk about, but um, we'll squeeze in what we can. I've kind of put them into four buckets, if you like, of music, family, business, and then I want to talk about you. Um, and let's let's kick off with music. It's something that we're both extremely passionate about, but it's certainly sown its way through your life from a very early age. In fact, your recent book, All the Right Reasons, which is an amazing read, um, the subtitle is 12 Principles for Living a life in harmony. And so I'm, I'd, I'd really like to understand why music has been so influential for you and really talk about living a life in harmony. Well, uh, ever since I can remember, uh, music's been a big part of my life and it's probably uh, due to my parents, uh, both very musical and all throughout my life growing up, there was always music playing in our home and my parents were very supportive of of me and my other uh, four siblings uh, ha taking music lessons and doing things even when they didn't really have the money to afford uh, those kinds of activities. And uh, I would find myself as a kid, I'd come home from school and I'd go right down to my bedroom and play music and practice instruments instead of out playing ball with the rest of the family or the rest of the, my friends. And uh, it this uh, love of mine turned from a just a hobby to a passion. Uh, I paid. I played my first paying job when I was in the eighth grade. So I was probably 12 or 13 when I first got paid to play music. And all through college, uh, that's what paid my way through college. My full-time job is I perform six nights a week. And uh, so it's something I love to do and something that's been very good to me. Uh, but back to your question on a life in harmony and how that plays in all of this, uh, I felt like living a life in harmony was an easy metaphor for people to understand because uh, we've all heard sounds, uh, harmonious sounds that sound very good and pleasing to us. And we've also heard sounds that are out of tune, uh, which cause resonant tones to happen, which is the opposite, opposite of harmony. And if we can live our lives so that we are uh, in tune with each other, in tune with our core values, in tune with who we are as people, uh, then this harmony happens and uh, it's, it's just a beautiful thing. So that's where that comes from. 
Well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of that really fun movie from 2001, Almost Famous. I don't know if you've seen that, um, <laughs> where a young kid goes on the road with a rock and roll band um, writing for Rolling Stone mar uh, magazine. And even though you're a bit, you're a bit older, um, but, you know, you're playing music and, and working at that stage in the music industry, um, it could have been you because the kid is portrayed as a, a good, wholesome boy from a rural American town, which is you. In fact, when I think about your strong Mormon upbringing, being on the road as a touring rock country musician and working with people like Ozzy Osbourne and Gene Simmons of Kiss, John Bon Jovi, when you were contracting with MTV. I mean, there's just some great stories. What was that like for you? And, and I mean, you had a really great mullet back then. I've got to show a photo of that. Um, how did you stay centred, though, during all of that time? Because it must have been, you know, there must have been some conflicting distractions around all that time. Well, um, certainly conflicting distractions when you think about uh, the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of approach to things. And, and that is very, very true in that environment. Um, for me, it was uh, that I had made up my mind long before I ever got on the road or was out uh, playing or traveling with one of these large rock bands. I had already made up my mind who I was, what I was going to do, and how I was going to act in certain circumstances. And so it became an easier uh, issue for me when confronting with alcohol or drugs or anything like that because I knew that was something that I wasn't going to do. And uh, you might find it interesting. Um, I'm probably one of the few people you may know, David. Uh, I've probably been around more drugs and alcohol than anybody you know, but I have never tasted alcohol in my life, not even a sip of beer. Uh, and because it was just something I decided I wasn't going to do, um, and as I grew, got older and witnessed what was happening to my close friends as they used drugs or as they used alcohol, uh, it even became more obvious to me that um, those choices were not the choices for me and the type of life that I wanted to live. And so, um, again, I think for all of us, uh, if we decide ahead of time, it's much easier than when you're in the heat of the battle or when you're in the middle of the storm uh, to try and make a decision as to what you're going to do or how you're going to behave. And uh, from a young age, uh, I knew the things that I did and didn't want to do. And for me, the number one goal was performing. And that for me was the drug uh, and yeah. something that I love to do. Yeah. And well, speaking of performing, um, I remember you telling me um, your worst experience, but ultimately what was your best musical experience happened um, at, at the same location just a few years ago, but in a pretty important performance. Yeah, I uh, was invited to play the Grand Ole Opry. And for those who aren't aware of what the Grand Ole Opry is, it is the most famous stage in the world for country music. And it's a place where all of the big stars, even Hank Williams and Patsy Cline and Willie Nelson and, 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 and the Eagles even uh, just performed there. Uh, about a year and a half ago, they were honored to be on that stage. So it's a big stage, but it's also a live broadcast that goes out uh, to the whole United States and beyond. And I, the way it works is they have several artists that perform in an evening at the Grand Ole Opry. And because it's a live broadcast, there's an artist out performing. And when the artist is done performing, there's a two minute break in between where the bands shift and a new band comes out. And so I was standing off the side of the stage with my guitar, uh, waiting to go on for our two minutes to run out and set up. And uh, I started having a panic attack. My heart started racing. Uh, my, I was just, my breathing was shallow. And I started talking to myself very negatively. You know, what if you forget the chords? What if you forget the notes? What if you mess up? And I started focusing on all of that. And uh, I had learned a breathing exercise, uh, which I immediately went into, which is uh, for, for four uh, repetitions, four times, you do it four counts. So you breathe in four, hold it four, exhale four, hold it out four, and you do that four times. 
And so I did that exercise, was able to calm my heart down, was able to uh, focus on the performance. So I went out and played the show. Um, but I honestly don't remember the performance of the show because of my state of mind. And so I had the opportunity to go back a second time and I made up my mind ahead of time that uh, I was going to take everything in and have a great experience and focus on being present, being in the moment, breathing properly and, uh, and, and just being uh, on this great stage. And so I was actually that second time uh, Keith Urban uh, a famous Aussie was on the stage and I was standing right next to him on one side and on the other side were Brooks and Dunn and uh, and so you could tell the, the kind of people that were around uh, before I went out but that time because I was very intentional I had the time of my life uh, I went backstage with the artists and and enjoyed the food I enjoyed the performance I enjoyed the crowd uh, much different experience and so yeah very much a potentially horrific moment, something I had thought about my whole life, uh, to a moment that uh, something I just relish is one of the high points of my music career. I mean, we're going to talk. We're going to talk about you um, yourself in a in a in a minute. But I know that um, in the past year, you've really found some uh, processes for yourself. Meditation's become quite important for you, and obviously, that's having an impact in the way that you're able to focus then, take yourself um, into a different place. How's that been for you? This is not a question that I planned on asking, but it just pops into my head. <laughs> well, uh, I'm the kind of person, my mind's going 90 miles an hour, and meditation was something that I honestly thought that I couldn't conquer. And uh, I learned a very, very simple, very easy uh, approach to beginning uh, meditation and uh, to get me into that mode and what it is is I close my eyes and for about 10 minutes I name every sound I hear so there's the wind there goes the car I hear somebody honking and I just for 10 minutes with my eyes closed I name everything I hear what that does is it brings me present it slows my mind down. It gets me focused on where I need to be, and it helps me get in that mode. Now, for a long time, that's all I did. Um, now, I've uh, graduated into some other techniques for meditation that I do every day uh, because one thing I have learned from my own experience, and I was told this, is that uh, meditation is something you can't just do in the moment when you're all uh, stressed out and you expect to calm down. It's something you need to practice and something that you need to regularly do as part of your routine. Um, and so, uh, yeah, meditation has become a big part of my, my daily routine. Well, thank you. Thank you for, um, for sharing that, mate. Um, I want to talk about family for, for a second, if I can. And, and your lovely wife, Laurie, and you have been married for over 35 years, I believe. Yep. Um, you have uh, four wonderful children and seven grandkids. My goodness, you're beating me. You and I have shared many stories, highs and lows, experience of our lives, family and business. What's tougher, being the CEO of a billion-dollar business or, or being a husband and parent? Well, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. I think the hardest part of my life uh, by far has been being the parent of adult children. <laughs> uh, I, I always thought going through life as my children were young and growing up that, that um, once they became adults, whew, they're out the door and off they go. And, and, uh, but in my case, um, that hasn't been the case. And uh, I've experienced some challenges with my adult children that I wasn't expecting uh, and by far have been more difficult for me to navigate than anything I've had to navigate professionally. Yeah, and so what's been the, and, and again, I'm, I'm digging a little deep here, but what's been the toughest experience for you as a dad? Well, uh, the toughest experience, uh, without getting too deep into details, is um, having one of my children have a, a severe challenge with mental struggles of anxiety and depression 
to the point where they did, did, didn't, they did not want to live. And trying to navigate through that and help them uh, help your child get to the point where um, life becomes bright again. And we're still knee deep in the middle of that struggle and maybe for our whole lives, but we have made progress through lots of therapy. Uh, I have uh, jumped in with both feet to try and learn as much as I can so that I can be part of the solution. I found that many of the things I was doing instinctively as a dad were actually part of the problem uh, where uh, it was my uh, intuition, my instinct to keep my child from hitting the ground sometimes when hitting the ground was what they needed in that moment. And uh, there are several things like that that I've learned. But um, so the hardest thing for me is watching my adult children have their struggles that they have. But the caveat to that is everybody has struggles and it's not that I didn't expect them to have struggles. The hard part of that is for me is letting go as a dad and saying, you know what, this is their life, they're adults, um, these are their experiences to have and to learn from. And for me to be there as a dad when they want the help versus me jumping in and giving the help and so kind of letting go, but still making sure they know they're always loved. Yeah, I mean, you've, you, um, you've talked about, and we've talked about this um, as, as mates, you know, the, the, the need to really push into the professional help space, both for, for your, your children and for yourself to know how to, how to best process that. Um, because it's a tough, it can be a tough space, and we've, we've both experienced that to go through. And seeking that, that professional support's really important. On the other side, what's been the best part about being a dad for you? What's the what's been one of the most wonderful experiences for you? Well, something I wasn't prepared for as to how great it is is to be a grandpa. <laughs> when these little children uh, come into have come into my life, um, it's just I can't describe uh, how beautiful it is. Uh, partly because. My only responsibility as a grandpa is to love them. And I don't have to discipline them. I don't have to train them and all the kind of things that you do as a parent. Um, but for me, uh, just to have them feel encircled with love, uh, which has really been liberating and a great experience. So by far, um, besides meeting my wife and being married, I have to say that, <laughs> I just love love these these little grandchildren that are coming into my life and uh that's by far the greatest experience well thank you for sharing with us i i we have many people in our audience who are juggling you know they're, they're either their busy corporate executive role or they're in micro enterprise we have a lot of the uh people from within our industry and our company usana who who are running their own businesses and 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 at the same time have kids coming along or grandchildren or all of these family issues and finding that, um, finding that balance. Um, and also I think knowing, um, you know, the vulnerability around that, that you need to be somewhat vulnerable at times to all of this. It's, it's not a perfect space, but it is something that, that, um, we're very blessed to be involved in. Um, so thank you for, for, um, for sharing with that. I, I want to, um, jump into business. Um, and, um, you know, you've had many business interests over the years. Um, so I ask you these questions both as, a, as the CEO of a billion dollar organization and as an entrepreneur yourself. Um, so what are the key areas of how you measure success in business? Well, um, success can be a very subjective measure uh, because it is so different for so many people. And success, I believe, has to evolve around your core values and how well you're meeting and staying true to your, your core value system, uh, your true self and those things. Uh, for me, that is where success is measured. It's not measured in dollars and cents, but it's truly measured uh, in lives that you can help, that you can improve, and it begins with yourself and then moves on to your significant others and then to your children and grandchildren and then those friends and family members 
but I measure success by uh, the opportunities that I've had to make a positive impact in people's lives. That's cool. Thank you, mate. The um, I, I, we you we talk about competition a lot, and and the competition definition seems to have really changed or evolved in in recent years pre-covid the amazonification of the world the way that consumers connected to a brand what's your how would you define competition today so for me and i'm be i get visibility into many many companies because of my position as chairman of the direct selling association um, i truly believe that competition is experience meaning what is a person who's interacting with your company organization service are you meeting their expectations based upon the experience they hope to receive and if you don't meet that experience level to their expectations they can very easily at the touch of one button go find somebody who will and so for me competi competition is is expected experience and and so we have to continually focus on anyone and everyone including employees shareholders customers distributors all across the board what is their experience as they interact with our company that for me is the overarching competitive issue that's happening in our digital world today yeah. Um, some years back, we were working together uh, with the group, with our executive group, our executive team to clearly identify our, our core values as a company. And then having done that task, um, what I what was really interesting, what, what happened next was you made a statement to the group that um, every decision that we were then going to make thereafter, um, um, having made those four guiding principles of community health excellence and integrity, and, and that those four values would be the filter for all decisions. In other words, if if a decision we were making didn't tick all of those boxes, we weren't going to do it. And and I found that a really interesting that that was the filter. It wasn't a financial, um, it, it wasn't a technological. It was around values. Can you just spend a few minutes? talking about that ideal as the leader of a company with that as their base? Yeah, um, I can use an experience that happened not long ago uh, here at USANA. Uh, we had a product that uh, when it went into uh, quality testing, uh, there was some a microbe that was found in the product. And so the decision could have been, okay, do we just sell the product as is because almost certainly no one would know about it. Do we nuke it, which is microwave it, so it kills the microbe, which causes other issues in the product, or do we just throw it away? And it was a multi-million dollar decision. And the way I measure whether or not our value uh, discussion is getting through to our employees globally is how they react in such situations like this. And the decision was made to throw out millions of dollars of product because one of our core values is excellence, another core value being integrity, and our product, our product quality is the top of the heap as far as us as a company. And so the way it, I saw that it worked is that decision never even made it to my office. That had already been made and carried through and although it was a multi-million dollar decision, me as the CEO, they didn't come to me and say, well, what do you think? Or what should we do? Or how should we make a decision? Because our core values are in place and the decision was already made. Yeah. And uh, so that to me uh, is an illustration of, of living and walking the walk uh, here that, that uh, I was very proud of our team and the fact that they didn't come to me and I even have to ask because they knew uh, what, what the answer would be. I, I recently read a, um, an interview that you had, you had done and I've seen it posted some advice for, for people, sort of five important things they should be doing around looking for a career opportunity in terms of, of furthering themselves. It's partly from elements of the book and 
uh, obviously research that you've been doing. But there's lots of people different listening in, many in the gig economy, micro enterprise space, as I talked about before. There's other executives. Um, the world's going through massive shifts now, um, and we're almost post-COVID, although there's bits and pieces coming back in. You know, as you look to the year ahead, what's your what's your what is your advice? You know, for people ask you all the time this. What's your advice for people as they're either pursuing their their career corporately, or they've got their own business, or they're a budding entrepreneur? What what do you what do you say to people as they look forward in business? I would boil it down into two things: one, emotional intelligence, and two, connection. So, first, emotional intelligence, and especially as it relates to a profession, a job, but also as it relates to interpersonal communications and relationships, uh, we have to be aware of people and meet them where they are. We have to have some empathy for what's happening because the world's a crazy place right now. Uh, I have huge empathy for our independent business owners, for instance, at USANA, because they've had to shift to uh, digital uh, technology. They've had to work hard. They've had in a time when everything's um, uncertain. Uh, the beauty of working through that, that's part of emotional intelligence. Another part of emotional intelligence is really just having integrity and being true to yourself, but also being true to the people you're working with or trying to communicate with. Uh, the second part of that is connection. Now more than ever, because we're talking to each other like we are now through uh, technology. And it's not face to face, it's not person to person, and it may uh, never be the way it has been in the past. Uh, hopefully we'll get close to where we were, but I think technology is here to stay. The genie is out of the bottle, so to speak. And so we have to focus on how can we truly connect with people uh, through a digital communication experience. And so connection is a, the second part uh, for both the worker as well as the person who's a, a part of the gig economy or a micro entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it. You have to find ways to connect with people. And, and, and one way, a person just did this to me, um, I, they got married and I went to their wedding and gave them a gift and, and, and left and they sent me a handwritten note. And uh, that to me was a way to connect that was different than anyone else who was saying thank you that week um, with a handwritten note. So there are ways to connect um, that uh, we may not think about, but I think we need to again be very intentional on connection. Yeah, who'd have thought a handwritten card in the mail would be delivering the kind of thing? We're talking about experiences early, earlier, and how important that is in trying to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely touch. So thank you. And again, I'd encourage people to go to kevinguest.com. There's so much great material in there that you've put together and lots of um, Q&A in there that's, that's worth reading through. I want to talk about you. Uh, specifically for a second. One of the, the things that we share um, is a great passion for experiences and doing things that, that we have great interest in, but also things that, that challenge the way we, we feel and think. And, and we don't need to speak about these ones specifically, but I do remember looking at your face two seconds before you jumped out of an airplane at 13,000 feet. You had a parachute on. And the other one, I mean, this was just this great fear, this look of fear. And the other one was when we were on the side of a boat, we were on a, on a trip together, and I was in the water, there were a group of people, and we're, we're sort of floating around with a bunch of small reef sharks. And the look on your face, um, you were the last one in the water, I didn't want to put you on the spot. Obviously, you wanted to make sure everyone was okay before you jumped in. And, and, but um, it was like you feel the fear in any way, feel, feel the fear and do it anyway. And pushing into new experiences in a positive way is a big part of your life. Is that is that right? Have I got that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it that's that's true, and it's been a little, or I shouldn't say a little, a significant piece of success for me throughout the years. Um, and a good example of that was many years ago, I had an idea to do a video magazine approach to people, rock stars who were on tour, and to show fans everything that they would want to see but don't get to see by going to a concert. So I 
would go on the tour bus and be backstage and be at the hotel and be everywhere that a fan would want to be and then put a show together like that. And uh, I pitched the idea to uh, a person and I got a phone call and they said, um, we've got an your first interview set up. Uh, we're, we're all in, we want you to do this. And the interview is with Gene Simmons. Uh, Gene Simmons at the time and still is one of the biggest rock stars ever in the world, bass player for the band Kiss. And they said, you've got it, you can interview Gene Simmons. I don't know, it was like two days, two days later uh, in Chicago, uh, which is, you know, a few hours air ride from here. And, but the problem was, is I did not have a camera. And so, and I didn't have anything to shoot the interview with, but I told them, okay, I'll be there. And so I was jumping into this new experience uh, with, with really no experience. Uh, and what I did was, is I went to a, a guy that I knew who owned a, an equipment company and asked him if I could demo one of his cameras. And he said, sure. I said, I'm starting a production company. Uh, can I, and I, I, so I got a camera from him that was a demo with the owner's manual. And I sat up all night in the hotel room in Chicago with the owner's manual, with the camera hooked up to the TV learning how to run the camera. And then the next morning, there I was in front of the biggest or one of the biggest rock stars in the world filming an interview that pieces have been seen all over the world uh, and which launched a big part of my career. Uh, but had I said, no, I've never done that or I can't do that, uh, but I had to put the time in and I had to get prepared. Uh, and the funny part of the story is I put this story in my book and the person who set up the interview with Gene Simmons got a copy of my book. Now, this is 20 or, I don't know, 30 years later. She calls me up and she said, Kevin, if I had known that, I would have never booked that interview. And so, uh, yeah, new experiences. Uh, I think uh, life becomes mighty boring if we're not putting ourselves out there. But it's also an opportunity to learn and to grow. And boy, did I learn and grow during that experience with Gene Simmons. Uh, I had the, when we jumped out of the plane, what a growing experience for me. Just what I did was I took inventory of myself and thought, okay, if I don't survive this jumping out of the plane, uh, what kind of life, what kind of legacy have I led? And so that gave me a point of self-evaluation to grow and become better. And I could go on and on. So. Thank you. What what has been one of your greatest personal experiences? I mean, that's a hard question, I know, but other than being married, you know. Yeah. Um, oh man, a lot of personal experiences have been great. Uh, just two months ago, I got to be on stage in front of fifty thousand people playing music uh, in a stadium um, with with uh, country music star Colin Ray, which was a great experience. Um, one of my top experiences, though, is well, I'll, I'll share two of them with you because, as you know, and I know you are, David, a huge Beatles fan. Um, I had two really great experiences as it relates to the only two living Beatles. Uh, one was um, I got to go to the sound check with Paul McCartney. Wow. And um, uh, it was an interesting experience because when you meet somebody uh, that you've grown to love and idolize throughout your life, it can really be a bad experience if they don't meet your expectations. And I've had that happen before with, with various people. And so I, with Paul, um, I was standing off to the side of the stage for the sound check and Paul walks out on stage and he hugged every person on stage, hugged the members of the crew. He knew them all by name. He asked them questions about their families. Uh, and the interaction from this, you know, probably one, the largest, one of the largest stars anyway in the world, to watch him uh, care about his interaction and relationships with his crew and his band, that was an incredible experience and taught me a huge learning lesson. Second one is similar to it. I had a chance to meet Ringo Starr. And before I met him, and obviously I mean nothing to Ringo and he didn't know me from another person he was meeting. 
But he walked up and gave me a big hug, looked me in the eye and engaged me in conversation. And so those are two of my very favorite experiences in the world. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That's pretty cool. I want to ask you a few um, quick uh, Q&Qs, which are quick questions and quick responses. Um, so what do these statements mean to you? Be present. Be present. It means uh, it, it's be where you are at the moment and in the moment. And don't let your mind be thinking about what might happen or what might come or what did happen or what didn't happen. But keep your mind in today. What do you think about when I say live in the now? Well, it's pretty much the same thing, but it's when you say add the word live in the now, that means action. That means so today do something. Uh, today get after it. Today uh, is the day, and today's the only day we have um, to get something done. And so make it worthwhile and make a difference. And finally, stay grounded. Staying grounded is so important. I remember uh, one time uh, a, a very a uh, close mentor of mine gave me some advice because I was out playing on stages and living the rock star lifestyle. And he said something, he said, whatever you do, don't breathe it in. <laughs> what he meant was, is you're the same as the fan out there. You're the same as everybody. So don't get a big head and remember where you came from, what you stand for, who you are, because Knowing who you are will change what you do. That, to me, is staying grounded. That's very cool. Don't breathe it in. Oh, that's a, that's some <laughs> pretty good advice. I mean, um, as I as I, and you mentioned, we've talked about the book, and I would encourage everyone to, to that hasn't seen that on uh, that they get a copy through Amazon.com. Um, but one of my favorite parts of the of the book is when you talk about the Dorothy principle. I know that's a, you know, favorite section. Can you just take a, 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 a just a minute to just expand on that idea? Yeah, so the Dorothy principle, um, where it comes from, is a uh, college professor gave his students a pop quiz. And on the quiz, he said it's pass or fail. And he said, I want you to name the name of the, give me the name of the lady who cleans our classroom. And nobody passed the test. And the professor was making the point that the lady who cleans our classroom, her name is Dorothy. And she is very important because if our room wasn't getting cleaned, you would know. Uh, and so the Dorothy principle comes from the, the issue of that Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr uh, taught me, nothing is more important than relationships. Thank you. Um, we've, we've, it's just been phenomenal to catch up with you today. I've got a couple more questions before we, we wrap up. So thank you for your, for, for your time. I liberated these from an interview that I was re reading that you did some time ago, but they're just so important. So um, first of all, you're a person of, of significant influence. You, you connect with you know, tens of thousands of people uh, around the world. If you could inspire a movement that would bring the most amount of good to the greatest number of people, what would that be? Uh, it would be the notion of leaving people better than you found them. So in other words, be a positive influence and a force for good in the world. And uh, I think if we each one by one can be a force for good and leave people better than we found them, uh, it won't take long for the world to be a better place. And I guess that, that flows through as well into your life lesson quote. I know you have a favorite quote. Can you just talk about that? Well, I, I love history. And um, uh, one of the uh, great um, people of history that I've studied is Sir Winston Churchill uh, from um, the UK. And uh, he was prime minister during World War II. And one of his quotes is a quote that I love, and it says, um, uh, we make a, a living out of what we get, but we make a life out of what we give. And so many times we're focused on what we get and our, our living, our lives are, what do I get, what do I get? But if we approach things with what can I give, 
uh, I think that will totally change our perspective and our focus as we move through life. Kevin, thank you so much for your time today, um, taking time out of your busy schedule and, and just sharing just such a broad range of, of topics and part of your life with uh, our audience today. As you know, we've got you know, a lot of our USANA folks that are listening in, and then we've got a, a, a whole new audience. And I know that everyone would really appreciate um, you sharing with us. And again, I encourage everyone to go to kevinguest.com to, to hear, hear even and read even more about you and your life and vision for the future. So thanks, mate. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Sir David. It's been great. Good, good stuff. Well, thanks, everyone. That's the uh, final edition of Driven for this year. And I look forward to welcoming you back to uh, the second season, which will kick off in 2022. So wishing you a very Merry Christmas and uh, a safe holiday time. Happy New Year, and we'll see you next year.